Okay, well, today I'm going to talk about, continue the series on the eight awarenesses of the enlightened person. And today is the fifth of the awarenesses, and it's called Not Forgetting Right Thought. And uh, Dogen wrote, this is also called maintaining right thought. Protecting the Dharma and not losing it means right thought or not forgetting right thought. And then the Buddha elaborated a bit more. He said, if you monks, he always says if you monks, because that's who he always talked to. He had his monks around him. But um, we can say, if you students of Zen, which will include everyone, seek both a good teacher and good protection and support, nothing is better than not forgetting right thought. For those who do not forget right thought, the robber-like multitude of deluding passions cannot break in. For this reason, you should always keep right thought in your mind and regulate it well. For if you lose this thought, all sorts of merits and virtues will also be lost. If the power of this thought is strong and firm, and then even though you mingle with a robber-like five desires, you will not be injured. Just as if you go into battle dressed in armor, you will not fear the enemy. This is the meaning of not forgetting right thought. <coughs> Excuse me. In his first teaching uh, of the Eightfold Path, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path to Eliminate Suffering, the Buddha included right thought as one of the Eightfold Paths. And sometimes uh, right thought is translated as right intention. So let's see how right thought and right intention complement each other. So wisdom, that said wisdom comprises right view and right thought. And what the Buddha meant by right is that it produces a beneficial uh, result. Oh, beneficial just means that it alleviates suffering of oneself and others. So in order to have right thought, you also have to have right view. Because without right view, you don't know where you're going. So there's several ways to consider right view. In one sense, right view is to have some understanding of the direction you need to set out. At some point in your life, you had a deep longing to feel complete. You started searching for a path. You might have talked to someone who encouraged you to practice meditation. And you listened to some instruction or perhaps some Dharma talk that resonated with you. You read a book, you know, such as The Three Pillars of Zen, in my case, which sparked interest and enthusiasm to practice the way of the Buddha. These events all contributed to your right view of how to proceed on the path. Another aspect of right view is to see things as they are, rather than using right view as a signpost, you begin to embody right view as an essential ingredient of who you are. It's not a separate idea, but functions in your life as your life. Now, right thought or intention means clear 
vision leading to clear thinking. And right thought leads to elimination of harmful thoughts and developing positive states of mind, such as metta, which means loving kindness. And right thoughts are opposed to hatred, ill will, or aversion, but rather developing thoughts of harmlessness or compassion, which are opposed to cruelty and callousness. In Japanese, the word thought is nen, which has two parts. The upper part is ima, which means right now, at this moment. And the bottom part is shin, which means mind. So thought, in this sense, is the mind of this moment. That seems straightforward, because we always say maintain the mind of the present moment. But when we reflect on the words of the Diamond Sutra, where it said the mind of the past is ungraspable, the mind of the future is ungraspable, and the mind of the present is ungraspable. So what mind is it that's the mind of the present moment? So we can ask what is a thought and what is a right thought? So in the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Buddha proclaims, everyone without exception has the wisdom and virtue of the Buddha. However, due to their attachments and deluded thoughts, they don't realize it. <laughs> so the Buddha's talks about right thoughts, he also talks about deluded thoughts. So what are deluded thoughts? So in the, when I first studied the Avatamsaka Sutra, I came to the conclusion that deluded thoughts are dualistic thoughts that separate us from everyone else and everything else. When During Jukai, for those of you who had went through the Jukai ceremony. Part of it, the Jukai ceremony, I say to not follow dualistic teachings, which are the teachings that separate you from yourself, from others, from the environment, from animals, from plants, and from God, or anything else we can name. And deluded thoughts include thoughts of harming, someone or something, thoughts of vindication or revenge, thoughts of jealousy, thoughts of possessing someone or something, lascivious thoughts, and the list goes on. I'm sure you could add your favorites to the list. Traditionally, right thought denotes thoughts of selflessness, thoughts of love, and thoughts of nonviolence, which are extended to all beings. It's very interesting and important to note here that thoughts of selfless detachment, love, and nonviolence <coughs> are grouped on the <coughs> are grouped on the side of wisdom. This clearly shows that true wisdom is endowed with these noble qualities and that all thoughts of selfish desire, ill will, hatred, and violence are the result of a lack of wisdom in all spheres of life, whether individual, social, or political. <clears throat> In the Eightfold Path, right thought is the second of the elements. The first is right view, and right thought is the second. 
This is a step where we become committed to the path. Right understanding, a right view, shows us what life really is and what life's problems are composed of. Right thought urges us to decide what our heart wants. Right thought must come from the heart and invo involves uh, recognizing the quality of all life and compassion for all life, beginning with yourself. Right thought means persistence and a passion for the journey. Setting out to climb a high mountain means you must understand the lay of the land and the pitfalls, the other team members, and the equipment you need. This is similar to right understanding, but you will only climb the mountain if you really want to and have a passion for the climb. This is right thought. The mountain we climb here is our journey through life. As we investigate our thoughts, we can ask ourselves the following question. Are these thoughts benefiting me and others? Do they stem from kindness or from desire? Are my thoughts serving my heart? Do they connect me with life or separate me from it? Thinking can seduce us into believing that if we continue to think more, we will solve our problems. Especially when we ponder future plans. The act of thinking gives us the illusion of controlling events and making things happen. <clears throat> when, when we're caught up in thoughts about the past, we often imagine that we can set right what has already happened. But thoughts do not lead to wisdom, which is an expression of mindfulness and letting go of habitual patterns of thinking. Now, I'm not going to say that we should make plans. We should not make plans for the future. But we should just be clear what our thoughts are. You know, if the thoughts give us the heart to engage in certain things, that's different than just cogitating and ruminating and running thoughts around in our head. But as we begin meditation practice, it's hard to resist the temptation to follow storylines of thoughts, especially if there is a pleasant or even an unpleasant drama involved. Such thoughts seem sticky because we so easily become attached to them and we forget to the return to the less exciting focus of the breath. As we become aware of our thinking process, we can practice watching thoughts arise move like a cloud across the spaciousness of the mind and pass away. We learn that we have a choice about whether or not to engage in thoughts. Often our thoughts are triggered by something that feels pleasant or even unpleasant. For example, Sometimes I have a thought that I'm on a vacation in a beautiful place with people I love. Then desire arises with further thoughts about how to prolong the pleasant experience. I fantasize about building a vacation house with all of the features to make it comfortable and pleasant. So at this point, I get so caught up with my thinking that I no longer see the scene that evoked my thoughts. But there's a downside to my vacation spot. So I was in danger of losing it. 
because it's in a beautiful place that sometimes is subject to wildfires and floods. So I start to think of the negative aspects of my dream vacation house. But now I'm so immersed in thoughts that I'm generating emotions of fear about a future that I've invented. I no longer notice the fantasy that so attracted me a short while ago. Sound familiar? Suddenly, I catch myself thinking and I return to sensations and sights just as they are in the present moment. Acknowledging that there's a mixture of pleasant and unpleasant experiences. Once again, I can appreciate the fullness of the moment and return to my breath if I'm doing Zazen. Sometimes we spend hours lost in thoughts <clears throat> about grasping what feels pleasant or escaping from what is unpleasant. We tend to miss the real pleasure in that very moment. With practice, we notice that physical sensations such as contraction, tension, or pressure are associated with certain kinds of thoughts, while sensations of openness and fluidity are related to other kinds of thoughts. At any point, we can wake up and notice the thoughts in our mind and return to our body sensations as a refuge. If I'm driving, I can let go of problem solving and connect with the sensation of my hands on the driver's wheel or my foot on the accelerator and my awareness of the other drivers and the traffic. If I'm walking, I can let go of planning what I want to do when I arrive at my destination. And I can sense the movement in my arms and legs or the contact of my feet on the ground. The um, meditation instructor, the insight meditation instructor, Jan Cornfield, noticed that there are certain themes to our thinking, our, our fantasies. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, the top 10 themes that we have. And he said that uh, some of our thoughts are so familiar that we think them repeatedly. And uh, these repetitions rarely contribute anything to our understanding or our happiness. And he says it helps just to identify them. For example, uh, I sometimes think of winning the lottery which is a futile pursuit because <laughs> I think the chances of winning the lottery are pretty much similar whether you buy a ticket or not. <laughs> <laughs> but I notice that I think about it more than once, so there's a theme there. So if we notice it, we can let go of it more easily once we identify it. So the more we let go of habitual thoughts, the more space there is for new insights to arise. Sometimes habitual thought patterns are so strong that we must uh, act like spiritual warriors to release them. When we repeat negative thoughts often enough, their familiarity creates the illusion that they're solid and true. But one insight meditation teacher said, there are absolutely no negative patterns that are true. So 
So one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves is to abandon negative thought patterns. Some of you may have heard of uh, Byron Katie, who um, is, uh, she's more than a self-help person, but she's a spiritual guide in, in many ways. And uh, she had four questions. She had a practice of four questions to ask yourself. When you come up with some kind of a thought, you know, for example, um, one of the thoughts that many people have is that I am unlovable or I'm not good enough. So the first question she would have you ask yourself, is it true? Simple question, is it true? I've already said that this one teacher, her name is Arena Weissman, said there's absolutely no negative patterns that are true. So right there is a true. And then, and then she asks again, Byron Katie, can you absolutely know that it's true? And after you explore whether it's true or not, she asks, how would you react when you believe that thought? If you believe that you're unlovable, how would you react? And then she asks, who would you be without that thought? If you were to absolutely let that thought go, who would you be? Sometimes our identity is so tied up with these negative thoughts. We don't know who we would be without them. But then it's worth pondering. It's helpful to remember that the Buddha called on the earth as his witness while he sat under the Bodhi tree. And he renounced an onslaught of doubts and temptations. If you read about the life of the Buddha, you know that the fiend Amara kept trying to tempt him away from his meditation. And then Mara finally said, well, even if you do to attain enlightenment, who's going to acknowledge it? Who's going to witness it? And he, and you maybe you've seen statues of the Buddha with a, his hand on the ground in, while he's in meditation, he says, the great earth is my witness. So we can try saying out loud when negative thoughts arise, no, I will not follow this negative thought. I call upon my inner resources to resist it, or you can call upon the great earth. Faced with such determination, thoughts tend to dissipate and reveal their impermanent nature. So there's another stage of right thought or right intention to cultivate joy, appreciation, and gratitude by praying or by focusing on counting our blessings and appreciating the qualities of those we love and of course, our meditation will help us do this. Because the Buddha understood the power of inclining the mind towards positive thinking, he taught the four ancient practices called the divine abodes or Brahma Viharas. And the four are loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity. So in Pali, the language of the Buddhist teachings, loving kindness practice is called metta. And the Buddha said you can search the entire universe and not find a single being more worthy of love than you yourself. It's through loving ourselves that we irradiate love outward toward others. 
And as my teacher, Maizumi Roshi, often said to appreciate yourself, that was his main teaching, learn to appreciate yourself. So if you encounter resistance to sending yourself love, it may be helpful to visualize yourself as a small and innocent child. So now, there is a, a chant, metaphrases, where we direct loving kindness for ourselves. You might recognize it because Mui recites it during every service, <laughs> right after the uh, Shosam Yokichi Jodorani, when you're giving loving kindness to those in your life who need it. So just, I'm going to read it one line at a time, and you can all repeat after me. So the first line, may I be peaceful and happy. May I be safe. May I be healthy. May I be at ease. And for the sake of all beings, may I be realized. That's a meta prayer. We, we recite it for others, but you can recite it for yourself. So, may I forgive myself for any unskillful thoughts, words, or deeds which have harmed myself or others. And remember that I did the best I could with the level of consciousness that I had in that moment. And also remember, your parents did the best they could with the level of consciousness they had at that moment. So not only did this meta work for ourselves, but also for others. And that's not forgetting right thought.